All right, welcome everyone. Um, hello, I'm Philip Moore. I'm from uh, Voltron Data. Uh, I was going to be co-presenting this session with Sebastian Estevez from DataStax. Sebastian just had a little baby girl, uh, so he wasn't able to make it, so I'll do my best to do it on my own. Uh, please forgive anything I miss, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, so this session is how to do OLAP on your Cassandra data with Arrow, Flight SQL, ADBC, and DuckDB. Um, so we'll be talking about these technologies, how they all fit together uh, to allow you to do OLAP queries on your NoSQL Cassandra database, including AstraDB, of course, DataStax's uh, commercial offering of Cassandra. So DataStax and Voltron Data, we, we kind of teamed up and we built uh, a Flight SQL server uh, for an Aero native engine to enable OLAP capabilities for AstraDB or Cassandra. Um, so if you have not heard of Flight SQL, it's relatively new. It's part of the Apache Aero project. It basically lets you connect a server up to a data engine um, that is really, you know, a data engine can really excel at querying data, but may not be necessarily interested in presenting a server to allow client connectivity. Flight SQL kind of lets you complete that picture and lets you enable that client connectivity to your data engine. So think of it as a component in a composable data system. So at Voltron Data, we really believe, we're big believers in the composable data systems. Uh, so we, we do that by establishing standards. Uh, so we have a substrate, which is a representation of a query plan. It's a machine representation that should be universal and can be sent to various data engines, including DuckDB, uh, an engine that we've just announced called Theseus that uses a GPU. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and we, we have ADBC, which is Aero Database Connectivity. And the really cool thing about ADBC, you've probably heard of JDBC and ODBC drivers. ADBC takes it a step further and allows uh, columnar data exchange throughout the entire communication process. So if you're familiar with, you know, even columnar databases like DuckDB or um, uh, Snowflake or whatever, usually at the last leg of the trip, they have to transpose the data to row-based format before it gets to the client. Aero changes that. And Apache Arrow format is columnar. So that means that the data is coming in a columnar format all the way through to the client. So it's an optimal transmission method uh, for the data. Uh, so I just touched on Arrow being a, a columnar data format. Um, so formats like Parquet uh, work really well with Arrow because it's already a columnar format. Um, but Arrow just enables that columnar transfer. Uh, so if you're not familiar with columnar data, it's, it, you know, it's it's really easily compressed, much better than a row-based format. Uh, so it's, it's much better for OLAP queries, and it works really well with vector databases that uh, proce process vectors with one single instruction that can process multiple rows of data. Um, so we, we enable a user interface via ADBC. We also have an Arrow JDBC driver and an ODBC driver. Um, now, the JDBC and the ODBC, they the data comes in a row-based format at the last second. It gets transposed. Uh, so it's not as good as the ADBC driver, uh, but it lets you get to your Aero Data Flight SQL Server. Um, we, of course, have execution engines. In this case, in this demo, I'll be showing DuckDB. DuckDB, if you're not familiar, is an in-process database or data engine. Uh, it's really, really good at OLAP queries. Uh, it's free. It's open source. Uh, and it performs really well on AWS Graviton or even x86. Uh, so we'll be kind of showcasing that a little bit. Um, and we believe in open data storage formats like Parquet and ORC uh, that allow you to talk to your, you can talk to your data with various engines if you use those open uh, formats like Parquet. All right, so I'll kind of get into uh, the solution architecture, what we built here. Um, so the first thing, of course, you know, Cassandra is, is a NoSQL database, like an object store, but sort of. Um, and <laughs> it's not really, it doesn't lend itself well to OLAP queries, like things like joins and things like that, that you typically do in OLAP type queries. You, if you're familiar with data warehousing, you know that typically you have a star schema, uh, a fact table that you join to dimension tables via a dimension key. Um, and those types of things don't work well in C SQL or CQL, sorry. Um, you know, it's not designed for that purpose. So we have to export the data from Cassandra to uh, an open format. Uh, we happen to choose Parquet. 
so Seb uh, and the team at Voltron uh, built this real-time, near real-time export process. Uh, so it makes the Cassandra data available as Parquet files for analytic engines like DuckDB or Theseus. Uh, separate analytics infrastructure with zero impact on uh, Cassandra latencies. It doesn't go through C-SQL, so this is like a separate process. Uh, it handles tombstones deduplication. Uh, the tombstones deduplication happened on the OLAP engine, so this thing is kind of pretty lightweight. It doesn't have to handle those types of things. Um, the, this proof of concept that we built uses a, a, a repo that Seb, I think, created. It's a data stacks SS table to Arrow. Um, and it just basically lets you export your data from Cassandra to the Arrow uh, to format. Uh, so you can see it, 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 the, the snapshots or backups happen in near real time, and it goes from the SS table format uh, to a parquet. Now, we, with the parquet files that get dumped out, we upload them to like an object store like S3 or GCS, uh, Google Cloud Storage. All right, so once you've exported the data, now you need to be able to query it, of course, right? So you need a data engine that's really good at OLAP. Uh, so we happen, for this proof of concept, we use DuckDB. Um, and the really cool thing about DuckDB is it speaks Arrow very, very well. Uh, so it, it, it talks to the Arrow ADBC and JDBC drivers uh, within the Arrow format, which is columnar. Uh, so the way the, the, the flow works, there's kind of two avenues to get to the data. If you remember, I mentioned JDBC and ADBC. Uh, so a typical SQL client is, is usually ADBC or JDBC or ODBC. Uh, so they will issue SQL uh, to the JDBC driver, which then sends the SQL down to the Arrow Flight SQL server process. Um, this then sends the SQL to the data engine, which in this case is DuckDB. Hopefully it's Voltron Data Theseus in the future uh, with it uses GPUs for acceleration. Um, duck, the data engine, of course, talks to the Parquet uh, format. Now, that could be on local storage, on the actual Vite SQL Server local file system, or it can be an S3 remote uh, file system. Um, it doesn't matter. Now, there are performance implications. Like, if the local file system is NVMe, solid state, and all that stuff, it's going to be probably faster. Uh, it's going to execute more swiftly because it, the data is local. It doesn't have to go through the network to get it. So once the DuckDB engine gets the data, it, it processes the query, and it sends arrow data to the Flight SQL server, which then sends arrow data through the, to the, the arrow Flight SQL JDBC or ODBC drivers. And at that point, the driver has to transpose the data to a row-based format for the client. Um, so there's, that last leg of the journey is not as optimal as it could be. That's where ADBC comes in. So ADBC, it's pretty very similar to the route I just explained, except that you're sending SQL through and you're getting arrow data back at all legs of the journey here. So it's a little bit more optimized uh, for that high data transfer. So if you're querying millions of rows of data, you're going to see a big bump by going to ADBC. Now, if you're just querying five rows of data or one row of data, the difference is so negligible that it's not, not a big deal. All right. <laughs> uh, so as always, there's always a trade-off. ADBC is very new, so not a lot of tools that not a lot of tools adopt it yet. Uh, but there's a lot of tools that talk JDBC. So you're probably going to use JDBC for compatibility. But if you need every drop of performance, uh, you probably want to go to ADBC. Um, so there's that's kind of how the, the architecture works, or the the, the solution. Now let's talk about the architecture. How do we actually implement this thing? Uh, so we, we deployed this uh, proof of concept in Kubernetes, and we used AWS Cloud for this. Uh, there's nothing stopping you from doing this in GCP or Azure. It's just the cloud we chose. Uh, so we, we run a stateful set in Kubernetes here that has the Aeroflight SQL Server running and DuckDB, of course. Uh, we have two avenues for the data. So we attach a local NVMe drive uh, to the to the instance, but we also have access to S3. Uh, so it just allows you two avenues to get to your data. If you can live, if you want, there's, remember there's always a trade-off, as you guys know, in IT. Um, if your exporting process is writing to S3, it's always going to be up to date if you're querying S3. Uh, but if you're going to be querying your local storage for performance, you're going to have to have a synchronization process that copies the data periodically from uh, S3 to your local drive. Sorry. 
All right, so the, the other cool thing is that we are using Graviton. So DuckDB runs really, really well on Graviton. So we're using Graviton 3 instances. <clears throat> and these, these nodes can be pretty beefy. So we're using R7GD 16 extra large, which has, <clears throat> pardon me, 64 CPUs and 512 gigs of RAM. So it's a pretty beefy server and actually gives you really good performance that's comparable to things like Snowflake um, and Databricks SQL. Um, with terabyte and below workload. So you can't go too big with this. You can't query like a 10 terabyte database. You can, it just won't perform as well as like a commercial solution. But it's really good for the money, which is very cheap. So these, these instances I think cost like $4.50 an hour. So to run <clears throat> terabyte scale analytics for $4.50 an hour is really good. Um, so, and again, so the Arrow Flight SQL ADBC or JDBC client is just sending uh, queried through uh, a load balancer, which has a TLS. Uh, so it, all the communications are encrypted. And of course, we enforce authentication so that uh, you know, we don't want to just let any schmo get in and get our data. Uh, so, but if you're familiar with DuckDB, it, there is no authentication. So we actually, the AeroFlight SQL server adds a value uh, layer there that's it's enforcing authentication and encrypting the traffic to and from the database. So it's, it's a secure solution. All right, <clears throat> so I'll try to demo uh, the solution here. Please pardon me. Uh, all right, so I'm going to use uh, one of my favorite tools, dBeaver, here. <laughs> so I think they're one of the sponsors of the event. Uh, and I talked I talk to them upstairs, got a sticker, so I'm really proud of that. Uh, so uh, I've go I'm going ahead and instantiate a connection. So I'm running a Flight SQL server now uh, in AWS, in Graviton. This is a live demo. What could go wrong? Uh, and it's, it's run that R7, uh, 16 GD extra large. So it's got lo that local NVMe, 64 CPUs, and 512 gigs of RAM. Uh, so if I, I have to instantiate a connection here, and it did. I'm running 092 of DuckDB. I think that's their latest version as of an hour ago. I hope they may have released since then. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> and if we query the DuckDB settings table, bear with me here. You can see that uh, we've given it 425 gigabytes of memory. Uh, so we didn't give it all the memory on the instance, but that's a lot of, pretty a lot of memory. Uh, and we, um, I think the threads parameter is the, yeah, so we give it 60 CPU threads. Uh, so it, it's pretty beefy uh, in terms of a, a database, much bigger, much bigger than you would think you could be, get available for free. Um, all right, so we've registered some views here. If you, if you expand here, you can, expand uh, your views here. And so we don't have any tables in this database. Uh, we just, we have views on top of Parquet. Uh, so the cool thing about DuckDB is you can create a view and just select directly from the Parquet. You don't have to ingest the data. Uh, it's actually faster to query Parquet, ironically, uh, than the DuckDB internal format. Because the DuckDB internal format is designed for updates and things like that. Parquet is not really designed for that. Um, so we've We've got basically two versions of the TPCH schema here. The one that's on local NVMe, and then the other is on S3. So if I query the customer table, it's going to go from the local disk. If I query the S3, it's going to read from S3 live. <clears throat> so let's test that out. Moment of truth. Uh, so you can see I query the region S3 table, and it just pulled directly from the S3 bucket. You have to trust me that it worked, <laughs> um, and so forth. Uh, and you can run longer queries, uh, like I can sum the extended price and get a, a record count. I won't run this one because it takes a while. But if I, if I run the other uh, version here, you'll see the latency is a little bit better. Right? Now, how much data are we dealing with here? Uh, so this is TPCA scale factor 1000, so it's a terabyte scale. Uh, so if I run this query, you can see that's 6 billion rows of data it just counted. Uh, and some that extended price, which is very high. Uh, but so it queried 6 billion rows that fast in the Parquet. Um, now it cheats with Parquet. There's some information in the Parquet that lets it cheat a little bit. But this query is a little bit harder to cheat with because it's querying all these attributes. Um, so we're going to query the line item table for and filter on the ship date and do a group by and order by. And so this query will execute a little while. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right, it, it almost always takes 10 seconds, so 
It's like Old Faithful. Uh, but uh, as you, it, it only produces four rows of output, but it actually queried six billion rows to generate those four row totals. All right. So uh, to me, like that blows my mind because I, I came from the Oracle world. Um, and to get that type of performance on terabyte scale, you had to spend a lot of money with Oracle. Um, so it's very exciting to me to be able to see this, uh, an open source solution running on Graviton with ARM processors for $4.50 an hour run that fast. Like I, that, that really blows my mind. I'm excited about it. So, um, so pardon, I'm nerding out a little bit. I apologize. But, uh, so, and then we can run query too. So you can, if you're familiar with the TPCH uh, query suite, there's 22 queries that you run to see can I get a general feel for performance of the database. So I think, I don't know, I don't remember how long this one runs, but it shouldn't take too long, hopefully. Yeah, so five, ten, five six seconds, something like that. Um, so as you can see, that DuckDB is really performant. Uh, and this, the cool thing about the Flight SQL Server is if we find something faster and if it speaks arrow, we can swap out DuckDB for that new thing. So it's really good for the Champion Challenger model. You can swap out components uh, as new components speak, that are shinier, faster, better become available. All right. Um, so all this cool stuff is, is open source, of course. So, you know, we, we're staying on the shoulders of giants. So Voltron Data has a repo for the Flight SQL Server portion. <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's, it's a public repo. If you do me a favor, star it, that'd be awesome. <laughs> but it's the Flight SQL Server example. Um, and there's this awful guy named Philip Moore that works on it. But that's me. Uh, but, <laughs> but long story short, in the readme we show, hey, how do you run this stuff? Uh, so it, it's easy to run in Docker. Uh, so you can literally uh, copy that, start a terminal, and spin up a, a Flight SQL Server on your laptop just like that. So if I do a Docker PS, let me make sure it's running. Uh, there it is. So I'll do Docker logs, Flight SQL dash F. All right, so it should be listening. Uh, so instead of the AWS one, I'll just connect to localhost, hopefully. And in this one, we actually do have real tables. So if I open a console, uh, I didn't generate a terabyte data on my laptop, by the way. So, the, so if I do a count star of this line item table, so it's 60,000 rows, much less data. <laughs> so, uh, but I have run 10 terabyte scale on this. It's not as nearly as zippy as terabyte scale uh, on, in AWS, of course, and on the laptop. Um, so it's, it's probably not a good solution if you're trying to query 60 billion rows. But if you're... If you're at that terabyte scale or below, it's a pretty good solution, I think. Um, now, the, the other, other things to worry about are concurrency. Uh, the solution, um, we, DuckDB doesn't really like multiple users connecting at the same time. It's not designed for that. Uh, so if you try to run two queries in the same database at the same time, it's like crossing the streams. Bad things can happen if you're familiar. With, I'm, I'm old, so it's a Ghostbusters thing. But uh, So you, you, you can get some strange errors if you try to do concurrent things with DuckDB. Now, we have mitigated that in the past in, in the AeroFlight SQL Server code base, which is a C++ code base. You could put things like mutexes in that, you know, basically lock a resource, you query some stuff, and then you release the lock, and then the other session, they just block and wait until the, that mutex is released, and then they're able to query the, the database. So it is, that's something that's not ideal. Uh, obviously, a more commercial solution like Snowflake or Oracle, uh, they're going to handle concurrency much better, much better than uh, DuckDB would because they're designed for that. Um, so uh, cool things like, so this is a, a JDBC driver, of course, and then the repo, there are instructions uh, on how to download and set up the JDBC driver. Um, so we have a, a link to another repo that how to set up the JDBC driver in dBeaver. Uh, so it just takes you to the screenshot step-by-step. Step. Hey, if I wanna start messing with the Flight SQL Server, how do I get started? This is a good way to get started and just query uh, the Flight SQL Server and, and, and turn some really wicked, uh, crazy queries against it. Um, of course, there are links also to, you know, what's, what's Apache Arrow? It talks about Flight SQL and Arrow and all that good stuff. Uh, so there's some article, blog, uh, links, and things like that. And of course, um, we say, hey, if you just want to mess with DuckDB directly, just you can click on the links to go to uh, DuckDB. Um, so there's also a section here where you can start up uh, you know, this is an example where you can attach your own database, and you can, in this, in this example, we generate a one gigabyte uh, scale factor TPCH database, and we, we start the Docker container 
mounting that local uh, database file. Uh, so you can get an idea. That's going to be, I think, 6 million rows as opposed to 60,000. So the 60,000 is a much very small, of course, uh, but you can start playing with bigger data sets on your laptop. You don't want to get too big. You know, don't want to go a terabyte because you probably don't have that much storage local. And if you did, you probably don't want to fill it up with the database. So um, the other cool thing is we do talk about how to set up the JDBC driver, but we also talk about how to connect and run uh, the ADBC Python Flight SQL driver. Um, so if, if you follow these instructions, you can, uh, we'll try it here, we'll try it live, Bill O'Reilly style. Um, so we'll just... Uh, We'll go ahead and set up a Python in virtual environment and install the packages. All right, and then, uh, so this is a little snippet of code here, should connect to uh, the Flight SQL database that's running locally on my laptop and just run a query. Uh, so this will use that optimized ADBC driver and get columnar data all the way through. Uh, so if we, Hey, it worked. All right. Well, there you go. All right. So as you can see, it just returned. I just selected from nation uh, where the nation key is equal to 24. And that happens to be the United States. Um, that one record out of the, the nation table. Uh, so the, and this, it, this format might look a bit a little bit weird is because it's the pi arrow format. You're probably used to pandas. Pandas is row based and pi arrow is, of course, column or data. So each column is represented with an array as opposed to a row based format. So that's why it looks a little bit different. Now you could, of course, do a two pandas on that. Um, so if we do a x dot two pandas, it looks on that row-based format. Um, so arrow works really well with pandas. Uh, you probably heard of pandas, of course. Uh, Wes McKinney was a co-founder of Voltron Data. Uh, he's moved on now, but he he uh, made sure that Pi Arrow uh, really worked well with pandas. So that, that's about it for the, the presentation and the demo. Um, I'm glad to take questions if you'd like. Yeah. So let me get you the mic. I think they want to have everyone. Thank you. So when you copy the SS table to the table, well, to your destination, right? mm -hmm. you mentioned, well, there's duplication of data there. I said that, okay, so the OLAP portion is going to take care of it. Can you elaborate on that? Is that when you run your query, that's going to take care of those duplicate, or is all those duplicates going to be, well, still duplicate in the destination? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so in the way we handled that, and I didn't actually demo that part, I apologize, because Seb wasn't here, but uh, we actually create views on top of the SS table export data. Uh, and we do a max buy. So there's some timestamps that are generated for each column, uh, that basically like a version history of each column of the, of the SS table. Uh, and we select the, the value that has the greatest timestamp. So we create these views that have that max buy operator. So it lets you get the maximum value by the other, another value in the, in the, in the table. Um, and so that, effectively that, that takes care of the tombstones and makes sure you have the latest version of that data. Now, there's a performance penalty because you're reading more data than you would have to if you just had the latest version, uh, but it's still it's still functional and works pretty well. Um, okay, well, to Tombstone and uh, latest is one thing, right? But you got uh, the if you're using a replication factor of three, you got three copy of that the data there, right? So your six billion row that you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. originally was only two billion row, right? In, in this case, this was a TPCH, so this was an OLAP data set, so it wasn't even an SS table. But uh, so Seb actually has the process to generate the SS tables. Um, I don't have that part of the solution. He was going to demo that part. But, Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I was just I was acquiring regular generic data, but yeah. essentially it's the same kind of thing. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, but your all app database still have well, three copy of the data still. Underneath yeah. 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 It, it, and there is a penalty for that. Uh, so it's not going to be as fast as if you just had the latest version. So, but um, did you compare the performance with other OLAP solutions like ClickHouse? 
Oh, that's a good question. Now, I haven't done ClickHouse. I have kind of benchmarked against like Snowflake and Databricks SQL. Um, they're faster, of course, but they're way more expensive. <laughs> but I haven't done ClickHouse. I need to do that. So that'd be really interesting to try. And also, did, have you, was this a prototype or was it uh, powering like a client facing application? It's just a prototype right now. Uh, I think I, th I think Seb is going to roll it out a little bit soon, but I'm not. Don't quote me on that. I don't know. If you had, you know, multiple servers that had DuckDB running on them, do you have any idea how you would um, keep consistency with the local files, so, uh, so that if you're writing to a, one of the nodes, that you get the same data? Or if, if just asking in the yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think. If you have them all query the S3 live, mm -hmm. that, that would maintain some yeah. sort of reasonable consistency. But, um, but if, yeah, if you copy... Costs, which yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Um, I haven't done that, though, so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that works great because like there could be some concurrency cost or some locking that I'm not aware of that could happen. But that would be me to try, yeah. Uh, when you export data to Parquet, do you have any kind of options to partition a certain way because, like... All of the things when you're doing parquet, it practically depends how you partition it. Yeah, I, I'm not. So, is it faithful export of SS table? It's probably just brute force. I think it's just brute force now, but of course, it, it is open source, so you can change the code to partition the way you want. To, uh, I think. <laughs> I don't want to speak to It's a little percent. bit like. Okay. Yeah. I think we have a question back there. Hey, thanks. Um, I was curious about, uh, it seemed like a core part of this was this kind of like keeping a columnar all, on the wire all the way up to the client, like the AWC. Um, like, is that actually significantly better than just doing some form of like compression of row-based, like some form of like dynamic LC4 on top of that? Is this like significantly lower total bandwidth back to the client? And it, if so, it, like what kind of ratios are you seeing? I've seen, I've seen 10 to 1. Uh, on on big data sets because uh, like particularly it, it all depends on how much repetition you have in the column. Right. Uh, it, you know, and row based data compresses pretty well too if you have a lot of repetition. Uh, but since it's columnar, like say you have a very low cardinality column like that has two values right. and you got millions and millions of rows, that's going to compress really well in a columnar solution. Uh, so that we have seen ten to one. But now if it's if it's two rows of data, it's not going to be. Measurable, I, you're not. You'd have to be really fast to, to measure it. Yeah, I, I was just curious relative to like generic uh, kind of like if you have a page and then you just run a good compression algorithm that like LC4 or something, like you also get ratio. And I'm just curious, like, is the columnar format really coming out ahead there? And I guess it sounds like the answer is yes. Yeah, from what we've seen, yes. Sorry. I, 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 yeah, I, I understand the advantage on the storage engine side. The other thing is uh, there's a serialization and deserialization cost. Uh, mm -hmm. The cool thing about the Arrow format is that you minimize deserialization and serialization because gotcha. uh, like it's it's shipped in the same format all the way through the sub the this ecosystem. If that makes sense. Uh, other databases typically have to do some sort of translation uh, for the client to understand it. I guess uh, so. Like a, an Oracle JDBC driver, for example, is going to get it over the in the Oracle wire format. But then it has to transpose it or deserialize it for to present to the client, for example. I see. So you're saying that internally, Arrow is even though it's presenting it as like a list of integers, it's actually only storing that once internally. That's what you're saying. It's yeah. I mean, essentially, it's some sort of magic because that's happened. <laughs> I, I can't I can't explain it 100 percent faithfully, but like, gotcha. It's it minimizes serialization and deserialization, and it's the same in all all languages, all formats. So like. It's the same in Java as it would be in Python and so forth. Right. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.